We are in 1 Timothy 6, 11 through 16 today, and I want to point out something uh, as we get ready for this message. Have you ever noticed that when people get elected president, they look a certain way, and then after they've been in office four to eight years, they look a very different way? I mean, the way I put it is they go in looking like a million bucks, and they come out looking like the national debt. Uh, it, it just has a tendency to age you, whether you're in your 70s or your 40s or somewhere in between uh, when you go into this office. And I think part of the reason is there's a tremendous pressure on the president of the United States because there's 332 people in this country, and we all want something different, and he can't make all of us happy. And, and then besides just the individual people, there's all these different interest groups. There's your own party. There's the opposite party. There's the media. No matter what you do, no matter what you say, you're going to get criticized. Somebody's going to be mad at you. And sometimes it seems like everybody is mad at you. And, and so you and I can look at that and say, man, I wouldn't want that job. And at the same time, we can say, I sort of feel that in my own life too. Maybe not to the extent. Obviously, I don't have 332 people paying attention to what I do and say, thank God. But all of us have people and groups of people who are important to us. And we bear the weight of their expectations and their, their d demands upon us. And, and so we, we recognize that sometimes the expectations of this group of people who are important to me uh, contradict the expectations of this other group of people. And that starts when we're little. If you're, if you're an adult and you, and you think that childhood is this blissful, uh, carefree time, you've forgotten because unless you were extremely secure as a child, and I wasn't, then when you're a kid, and especially when you're a teenager, childhood can be terrifying. It can be this time of stress and pressure, and it's very easy to say, well, you know, just don't care about what that person thinks about you, or don't care what those other kids say. Well, that's easier said than done. And I know that when I was a kid growing up, I, as a boy, I can tell you this, and it's probably still this way, there's, a, there's a, a certain extent to which you need to pretend to be tougher than you are, otherwise you'll get eaten alive. But then I raised a daughter, and I realized it's even harder for the girls than for the boys, because a mean boy will come along and, and beat the snot out of you and leave you alone, but a mean girl will make your life a living hell for the rest of your life, right? It's, there's just a difference there. And, and then you've got your parents, and then you've got your teachers, and you've got all those expectations, and then you grow up. And it doesn't get easier because then you've got a boss. And even if you've got a good boss, he's got expectations for you that sometimes you feel like you can't fulfill and still live a healthy life and still have a family. And you have to measure that. And okay, how, can, how much can I disappoint my boss without losing my job? How much can I disappoint my family without losing them? How much can I, can I infringe upon my own sleep patterns and my own life without totally burning out? And, and then if you have kids... You know this struggle, those of you who are parents, because you want your kids to be happy, you want your kids to like you, but at the same time, you know that some of the things that would make them the happiest in the short term are some of the worst things for them, and so you have to, you have to weigh that as well. You face this pressure, plus you've got parents and in-laws and other parents who are comparing themselves to you and your parenting style, and there's so much pressure. And I've just named three relationships. There's so many others that we face. Now, Timothy, and Nathan kind of mentioned it, Timothy was a young man who 2,000 years ago faced an enormous amount of pressure because he had become the pastor, the leader of the church in a, in a city called Ephesus, which was a town in what is today Turkey. It was a church that Paul himself had started, and after he left, because he was a traveling missionary, he installed Timothy, his protege, in that role. And then he writes him this letter to say, here's my instructions for you, here's how to get it right, here's what you're going to need to know. Now, based on what he says in 1 Timothy, I've identified eight sources of pressure that Timothy had. And I'm going to run through these real quickly because this isn't the sermon, y'all. This is just the pre-sermon. I'm sorry. So you want me to say this fast. But first of all, he had the citizens of Ephesus to contend with. It was a pagan city. And that meant they were polytheists. And for him to stand up every Sunday and say that Jesus is the only way to salvation got him into trouble on a regular basis. He knew this. There had been a riot in Ephesus not so very long before this. He had, number two, older members of his church. Timothy was a young man. So a lot of people in his congregation could have been his parents, maybe even his grandparents. And Paul knew that Timothy would face some pressure of saying, why should we follow you when we're so much older than you? And so he writes in, in 1 Timothy 4.12, let no one despise you for your youth. Understand, this is going to be something you'll face, but overcome it. Number three, he had distractions. 
Paul writes in chapter four, verse seven, have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. See, Paul knew even in the first century that even though Christians, as Christians, we have the best news ever, and we've got the word of God, which will never get old, which we'll never get to the bottom of. It's still, Christians have this weird fascination with other stuff. We, we wanna talk about anything but the word of God. And, and so Paul is saying, listen, watch out because people in your culture, they're gonna cling on to, they're gonna grab onto these uh, local mythologies and say, okay, what is true and what's not? Timothy, we wanna hear from you. What do you think about this particular archangel and this particular demonic figure? None of which is in the Bible. And he's saying, stick with the word of God. And it's the same today. I, I've got a good church, so I don't really face this particular pressure, but I've talked to other pastors and they'll say, yeah, I, I want to preach the word, but everybody all, they just want to hear about the latest conspiracy theory, you know, how 5G waves are turning us all into lizard people or, or whatever, you know. And so Paul is saying, stick to the word of God in, sp- in the midst of all these distractions. Your people are going to be mad at you because you're not talking about what they want to hear, but talk about what they need to hear. Number four, love of money. Y'all, I hate to say this, it's not, it's not impossible to be wealthy and a follower of Jesus, but if being wealthy is the goal of your life, it's impossible to follow Jesus because you have to choose a master. And, and Paul knew this, and he knew that the people Timothy would be preaching to were not wealthy, but they wanted to be. And if he preached the true word of God and talked real discipleship, some of them would get mad and leave because they'd know that's too hard. I can't follow that road and get where I want to get. And that would be hard on a pastor. So he tells him, remember in, six, in chapter 6, verse 10, the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. So don't get caught up in it. Number five, he talks about tough decisions. That's, that's the main topic of the book. He talks about you need to appoint new leaders. Can you imagine going into a new church and then selecting uh, five men to be the elders of the church and, and knowing that, well, I don't know, is, is this guy really a godly man? Does he deserve this role or is he just pretending? And, and this guy I know wants to be a leader, but he's not qualified. Is he going to be mad at me? Yes, probably. That's pressure. He said, you need to take care of the widows and watch out because there are some women that are just busybodies and they don't need your help. They're doing fine. But, but there are others who are legitimately in need of help and you need to know the difference. You think some people got mad at Timothy over that? I, I believe probably that would be the case. You need to train young people to respect their elders. You need to train older people to, to take on these younger folks as, as protégés and to love them as they should. And, and that would cause stress. So tough decisions. And then number six, false doctrine. It's all through the New Testament that the devil is going to continue to try to sow these little seeds of false teaching into his churches, into into the the Lord's churches. And and it's always dangerous because the devil's smart enough to make it sound sort of like gospel, you know, sort of like it could be in the Bible. And and so Paul just continually warns, watch out for this stuff. It It can just totally sabotage your church. And then in number, number seven, he, he mentions there's a danger of falling away from the faith. I don't know if you know this, but I know a lot of people who started out in ministry when I did or at the age I did, and they were just on fire for the Lord. And today, not only are they not in ministry anymore, they're not even going to church because the ministry can be a meat grinder emotionally, spiritually, if you don't have your, your stuff together and if you run into the wrong kinds of people. And, and Paul says, watch out in chapter one. He says, watch out because a lot of guys have, have shipwrecked their faith. That's the term he uses. And he mentions two in particular, Hymenaeus and Alexander, two men who once preached the gospel and now they've turned away. Timothy knows he's got a target on his back. The devil would love to take him down. That is pressure. And then there's number eight, and this is not in the text But I assume this, I assume that it's stressful to follow Paul in the ministry. Because who matches up to the Apostle Paul? And especially if you're a guy like Timothy. Don't get me wrong, Timothy seems to have been a wonderful person. And Paul praises him several times in Philippians 2.20. He says, I've got no one else like him. But there's also indications that Timothy didn't have the same bold and tenacious character as Paul did. Because, for instance, he says, Paul writes to Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.7 and says, God's not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self-control. In 1 Corinthians 16.10, he's writing to the church in Corinth and he says, when Timothy comes, or if Timothy comes, see that he has nothing to fear while with you. And so there's this indication, a lot of Bible scholars believe that what we see there is Timothy's just, he's more like you and me than like Paul. Whereas most of us, We care what people think. It bothers us when folks are angry with us. And we are tempted to do whatever it takes to keep people happy and therefore sometimes miss what God wants us to do. 
So imagine this young man, Timothy, he's under pressure. What is Paul going to say to him? How does he wrap all of this up, all this instruction up? And here's what we see. Here's his word to us as well as to Timothy. Verse 11 of chapter 6. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of the Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. So what Paul does for this young man is, first of all, he gives him a pep talk. He says, don't give up. Don't stop fighting the good fight. Don't let anything distract you. But then in the last two verses, he gives him a doxology. Now you saw, if you haven't been with us already and heard this already, you saw in the little video that James made for before my sermon. Doxology is a word that comes from two Greek words, doxa and logos, that means words of of glory. It's, It's whenever someone just has no other agenda but to praise the Lord. And they just spontaneously or strategically just say, let me tell you how good God is. And that's what Paul does here, which seems like an odd choice. Because we read the Bible, when we read the Bible and we get to these doxologies in Scripture, which by the way, that's what our series is about right now, we have a tendency to just sort of skim over that part. Because if you're like me, you want to get to the meat, you want to get to the instructions, you want want some marching orders, some advice, some counsel from the Word of God, but I urge you to pay attention to these doxologies because what this is, is people who know God better than you do saying, let me tell you about Him. Here's what you don't know yet. And if you just get this vision of God, if you just see him for who he is, if you really, really praise him as he is, it will change your life. In fact, you get a chance to put this into practice in about about 20 minutes or less when we sing a couple of songs at the end of the sermon. If you will sing those songs and mean those words with all your heart, it will change who you are in a fundamental way. And when you are under pressure, when you are under stress, if you will turn to praise, it will equip you to do the right thing. And you say, well, how on earth is that possible? How can I possibly overcome the stress and the pressure and the expectations that people are putting on me just by singing a song or just by thinking thoughts about God? Well, let me show you how. So let's walk through this this doxology real quickly. The first three, we're going to say, he he says seven things, by the way, seven things about God in this doxology. And the first three, we're going to be able to take at the same time because they mean the same thing. He is, number one, the blessed and only sovereign. He is, number two, the king of kings. And number three, the Lord of lords. He's reminding us that while Jesus came into this world as a peasant who died on a cross, He's returning as a conqueror on a white horse with King of Kings and Lord of Lords written on his thigh, according to Revelation 19.16, bearing a sword. He came bearing a cross. He's going to return wearing a crown. That's Jesus. He is the one and only sovereign. He is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. He's not the first among equals. He is the only one, the only God. And I know, I know that sounds arrogant. If you are not a Christian, or maybe even if you are, and you're just used to living in a world with so many different viewpoints and religions, it sounds arrogant. And you know what? It would be if I were standing up here saying, First Baptist Church Conroe is the way. Southern Baptist churches are the way. Or this particular breed of Christianity is the way. Or I am the way. No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying Jesus is the way. And only Jesus And I'm saying that not because I've found some great secret. He makes it clear in his word. He says it over and over and over again. I recently was in a group and we met with a guy who was of another faith and he he had a chance to share uh, the the essentials of his faith with us. And he did a good job. He was very well-spoken, very respectful. When he got done, he asked if we had any questions. And I was the first one to raise my hand. And I said, yeah, I would like to know what you and and others of your faith believe about Jesus Christ. And he said, we believe that Jesus was a man who brought others to God. And I thought, well, that's a really good answer. 
Uh, it's really respectful of, of me as a Christian, and it, it plays well in, in a world where there are lots of different faiths. He's essentially saying Jesus was a good person. He, he's one of many people who did their best to bring others to God. And, and it, it would be a perfect answer except for the things that Jesus said. Because if, le- if you read what Jesus said, you can't possibly believe that. To read the things that Jesus said, you can only come up with one of three uh, conclusions. I didn't get this from me. This is C.S. Lewis. He's either a lunatic, like a guy who believes that he's the Queen of England, right? Or he's a a con man, like the kinds of men down through history who've started cults and led people to destruction. Or he's the Son of God. There's really no alternative but those three. And we believe, or I believe, and I, I believe most of you do, that he is the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And that is what he claimed, and that is what we believe. Number four, Paul says that he's the one who alone has immortality. Immortality doesn't just mean that you don't die. It means that you were never really born. You have always existed. That's not true of you and me. We have the chance to live forever with God because of his salvation, but if you tell me how old you are, I can tell you how long you've existed. Because all I have to do is take your birthday and go, okay, so about 40 weeks before then, give or take, that's when you were conceived and that's how long you've existed. Before that, there was no you. They're just, I mean, I don't care that you've seen some cartoon that shows a bunch of souls in heaven and God like, okay, it's your turn. That's not the way it works. You did not exist until you began to exist in your mother's womb. But Jesus has always been. Look at John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. He says, the Apostle John writes, In the beginning was the Word, the Word, the Logos, Jesus. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And that goes well with Colossians 1, 16 through 17. For by Him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through Him and for Him, and He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together." So I believe Jesus, when he was here, he was like us in so many ways. He got up in the morning. He was probably tired because he didn't get enough sleep the night before. If he worked hard all day, he was tired at the end of the day and his clothes stunk, okay? Because he was human like us. The Bible doesn't say this, but I believe Jesus caught the common cold and he caught stomach bugs and he got frustrated. He, He shares our experiences, except he was immortal. So I believe there were probably times when Jesus was talking to someone and it just crossed his mind. Yeah, I remember when I created you. And I remember the plans that the Father and the Spirit and I had for you from the very beginning. And the love we've always had for you. Even as you're spitting in my face, I remember, I remember all that about you. And you wonder how Jesus could be so compassionate to people who hated him. It's because he knew them. Really, really knew them. Like, like a mother knows her little child right? He is immortal. Not only that, he dwells in unapproachable light. Matthew 17 says there was a day when Jesus and three of his disciples, James and John and Peter, went up on top of a high mountain, maybe Mount Hermon, that's my theory. Doesn't matter. They were up there and suddenly Jesus, who was this apparently ordinary looking guy, suddenly transfigured into something completely different. So brilliant, so glorious that they couldn't even look at him without hurting their eyes. And it was it was God's way of saying, There's more to Jesus than you think. This is who he truly is. It was also God's way of reminding them of Exodus 24. Good Jewish boys, they would have learned this story from their parents' knees. I mean, they would have known Exodus 24 when when Moses went up onto Mount Sinai to get the law and the people stayed down on the ground and they looked up to the top of that mountain and they saw this consuming fire, this furnace, this, uh, this inferno on top of that mountain. They said, well, Moses is dead. We'll never see him again. And then he comes walking down the mountain with those tablets in his hand and what God is saying is, that's me. You see this brilliance? That's me. That's, I, I dwell in unapproachable light. I know, I know in the form of Jesus, I look normal. I look like anybody else, but there's more to me than that. And, and I just want to say, sometimes we say things very flippantly about God. Like, well, you know, I, I can't wait to, to ask God that question. Or I wish God would, would come down here and, and, and explain this to me. Or even in, 
in frustration or fear or, or sadness. We say, I just want God to appear to me now and, and help me in my time of doubt. And I just want to say, be careful what you wish for. Because in Scripture, whenever God appears to someone, it's the most terrifying moment of that person's life. And sometimes they walk away and they're physically changed, like Jacob walks away with a limp. It is no minor thing for God to appear to you. Because let's be clear, God loves you more than anybody will ever love you, but he is not your big cuddly grandpa in the sky. He's not your sugar daddy. He is a consuming fire, according to the book of Hebrews. He dwells in unapproachable light. And number six, Paul says he is the one whom no one has seen or can see. You might say, well, Jeff, you just talked about people seeing God. How, what do you mean? Well, think about the times people saw God in Scripture. Moses saw him as a burning bush. Abraham saw him as one of three men who showed up at his tent one day. Job saw him as a storm coming down out of the sky. Uh, Isaiah saw him as a mighty king sitting on a throne, lifted up above the temple of God. Elijah just heard a gentle whisper and knew that was God. Thousands of people saw this humble carpenter from Nazareth and became to believe that he was God. See, God can take any form he wants because he has no basic form. He is spirit. He's invisible. He cannot be seen by you and me. We're flesh and blood, but he's not. He is God. And then finally, number seven. Paul says, to him be eternal honor and dominion. And I have to confess something to you here. Um, whenever I read through the Bible and I get to the, the resurrection stories in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, there's a part of me, I mean, I rejoice in it. Don't get me wrong. It's the greatest thing that ever happened. But there's a part of me that's like, okay, Jesus, I wish you would have done just this one more thing. I want Jesus to come out of the tomb and then immediately show up at the next meeting of the Sanhedrin and say, how do you boys like me now? Now, I want him to go up to Pontius Pilate in his office and say, you said, what is truth? Well, I'm here to tell you what truth is because you're looking at it. But he doesn't do that. He doesn't confront his accusers, his tormentors, his critics. He just appears to his followers. He trains them for the kingdom of God, and then he ascends into heaven. And of course, I know God's plan is better because the Bible is clear. Someday, Caiaphas and the rest of the Sanhedrin who condemned Jesus to death and Pontius Pilate who ordered his execution and all of his other critics will stand before him in judgment. And don't you think their knees will quake? And I know every evil, bloodthirsty dictator and tyrant who's ever existed will face judgment too. And so will every person who's ever mocked his name. And so will every, every bully who's ever mistreated one of his people, including one of us. And so will you. And so will I. He has eternal honor and dominion. That means that everyone who has ever lived will answer to him and to him alone. And I think ultimately that's Paul's point in this doxology. He's saying to Timothy, listen, I know, I know you're under a lot of pressure. I've been there and you're not built like me. So it just doesn't naturally roll off your back. But just understand in the end, in the end, there's really only one who you have to please. There's really only one audience, an audience of one, and that's, that's Jesus Christ himself. He's the only one that's going to render judgment on your life. His opinion's the only one that matters. That's why he says in verse 14, keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's talking about the second coming. It's not something we talk about a lot these days, but that is our hope. That's what we're all looking forward to when Jesus returns. And on that day, we will answer to him. Every single one of us, we will answer to him. And so let me ask you right now to do a little mental exercise and ask yourself, who is the main source of pressure on me right now? Is it one of your critics? Is it one of your enemies? Is it your employer? Is it someone you love that maybe doesn't love you back the way you want them to? Or maybe is it someone who means no harm to you at all? Maybe it's uh, uh, someone who, with whom you have a great relationship, but you're worried about what's going on in their life. You're worried about, can I be what I need to be to them? Or, or what is God going to do for them as I'm praying for them? And there's all sorts of things that can be weighing you down. But what is the one thing, if you could get that resolved, if, there, if you could just have less pressure there, your, your life would be easier. I want you to think about that for a moment. And then Ask yourself, okay, what does God want me to do in that relationship? How does God want me 
to respond to that person? What is God's will for me in that relationship? Because that's the only question ultimately that matters. So, so let me just go over this real quickly. So if you're a parent, if that's, your mon- if you're, that's your number one question, you're not just trying to keep your kids happy, you're trying to please God. Well, sometimes your kids are going to love that because you're going to be a good parent. Sometimes they're not going to like it at all because you're not going to give them what they want. But in the end, you're not going to have any regrets about your parenting because you always did what was right, even if it wasn't easy. At work, if you do the will of God consistently, sometimes you will be the best employee in that place because you'll work hard, you'll be conscientious, you won't be a source of drama. But then sometimes you'll get on people's nerves because you're the one calling out abuse, because you're the one refusing to do unethical things that everybody else is doing, because you're not the one laughing at the dirty joke that everybody else thinks is hilarious. If, if you change the way you act towards your friends, they might think that something has changed in you, that you've become self-righteous because they like to go to that particular place after work lets out and do those things that you now know are wrong. And they're going to think, what's the matter with you? You used to be so fun. You know, doing the will of God in your relationships does make you a better friend, a better neighbor, a better spouse, a better employee. But it's not always easy. It's not always popular. What I'm trying to tell you is, that doing the will of God doesn't take the pressure off, but it enables you to do the right thing. You can sleep at night. You can live through it. You can survive this pressure. You can survive the stress. And again, I say to you, when you are under stress and don't know what to do, there are three things I would do, okay? I would pray about it. Lord, tell me what to do. If I don't know after praying what I'm supposed to do, I talk it over with some trusted Christian friends. That's what a church is for. That's why you should be part of a life group. So you don't just have, you know, there's that guy who sits next to me on the pew. I have no idea who he is. But if you're in a life group with them, you know their name and you can come next Sunday or you can text them that day and say, here's what I'm struggling with. Can you give me some advice? So I would pray about it. I would talk to trusted Christian friends and I would just praise the Lord. Jeff, you've never heard me sing. I don't care. You don't have to do it where everybody can hear. Get in your car, drive down the road, and sing to your heart's content. People will think you're nuts, and that's okay. They won't carjack you, okay? But praise the Lord. And if you praise the Lord, you remember how big He is. And suddenly, the expectations of others don't control you anymore. And if you're worried, and you say, You know, Jeff, this isn't making me feel any better because you said that I'm going to have to stand before God in judgment someday and his opinion's the only one that matters. And it sounds like he's really hard to please because he's a consuming fire and he dwells in unapproachable light and no one's ever seen him. And let me just, let me just tell you this little story that I totally made up. And after the first sermon, somebody said, said, uh, you've, you've watched a lot of Westerns, haven't you? I said, yes, but it has a point. Okay. So imagine there's a city guy. 150, 200 years ago, this part of the world, decides, I want a place in the country. Sells his house in the city, buys a little spread, a couple of acres, barbed wire fence, little house. He's so happy. The first day, he rides into the nearest town, goes to the local saloon to celebrate. Celebrates a little too much. Pretty soon, the sun's coming up, and they say, Mr., you got to hit the road. We're, We're closing up. He staggers out into the sunlight and realizes, I'm in really bad shape. I can't even remember where I tied my horse up. I I think I'll just just walk home and sleep this off. But on the way home, he gets lost. He goes through a gate, opens the gate, and thinks, I don't remember having a gate. Goes up to the door, and that's when he realizes it's not his house. He's come to the completely wrong place. Then turns around and realizes he's now letting this poor guy's cattle out. The cows are just flowing out the gate, and he doesn't know what to do. And right then the door opens, and, and it's the homeowner, and he sees what's happening, and he immediately calls his sons, and they all get on their horses, and they round up the cattle, and they bring them on in. And, and this, this city guy is so apologetic. How could I have done this to you, sir? I'm so sorry. And the guy says, listen, we're neighbors. I will never hold this against you. We all make mistakes. Here, come have some bacon and eggs and biscuits with me and my boys and a lot of black coffee. It looks like you need it. And you think, man, what a great guy. You've sobered up by now and you decide, I'm going to head back into town and try to find my horse. But on the way in, you run into this group of guys on horses who come up to you and they say, listen, we saw you opening that gate and that's not your place. We hang cattle thieves around here. You're coming with us. 
And you try to explain what happened, but they won't listen and they tie you up and they take you and they throw you in the jail and they say, the judge will be here in an hour. And you've got an hour to think about the fact that you're just about to die because you drank too much the night before because you were a fool. And then you stand in that courtroom, hadn't slept in 48 hours, you look terrible, you feel terrible, you're about to die and the judge comes in and you look up and he smiles at you. And you smile back at him because it's the guy whose cattle you let out. And he wraps the gavel and says, we've already settled this, case dismissed. And I tell you that ridiculous made-up story to tell you this. Someday you will stand before your judge. But on that day, when you look into your judge's face, you're going to see the face of your Savior. You're going to see the face of the one who made you in your mother's womb, who had dreams for you before you were ever born, the one who died for you on the cross and who's chased you ever since. You're going to see one who loves you. Will you have to give an accounting? Yes. And will you, will you be disappointed in some of the things you did? Will you have regrets? Probably so. But you know what? All that's going to matter on that day is he's the one who saves me. The pressure's off. 